Hello, I'm Mark Elliott from Fluent Finance Abroad, and I'm very happy to say that I'm here with uh, a gentleman that I think we all know in the industry, in the real estate industry, Alfred O'Gloy Dawson. Hello, Alfred. How are you doing, man? I think it's about time that we actually found out more about the man who behind the camera. Obviously, you're very, very much involved in the real estate business uh, here in the Costa del Sol. So let's kick off then. So tell us a little bit about Alfredo and, and a bit about your background, please. Well, I'm English. I was born in England. Moved here in 1975 with my family when I was four. Grew up over here, went to school here at an American school in Trevor Lyons. Did the university and 10, 15 years in the UK working and moved back in 2008. Uruguayan mother, so that's why they name Alfredo. I'm not the, I have nothing blood wise related to Spain unless you go back to my mother's Uruguayan heritage to Vigo or somewhere in the Galicia area. And, and when I came, my past in England in terms of professionally, I studied accountancy, but I didn't, it wasn't really for me. And then I worked for 10, 15 years in management in the UK all over the north. And it always wanted to come back from the UK to here because I, I had grown up here. So I kind of knew the lifestyle was better than it is in the UK to my taste. I think if you've never had it, you don't miss it, but if you had it, it's hard to, it's hard to stay away. Many of my friends that grew up with me have come back since with their families. It's a good place to raise a family. So I moved back here with my then girlfriend in 2008. And we eventually got married and had two kids, got two girls, nine and 10. And when I came back the first three and a half years, I worked in the newspaper, the Euro Weekly News. So I was, when I left, I was the editor. And from there, I went into a marketing agency called Voodoo, which was where my wife was working. So it was kind of a natural thing. The way marketing and real estate and all that kind of stuff was going was towards content. And so they thought, let's get someone that's worked at a newspaper that's pushing up 400 pages of newspaper every week to help generate content for our clients. And the majority of those clients were real estate agents because that's where the money is at here on the coast if you're not running a leisure facility. Can I, can I just take it back? <clears throat> Yeah, to your time in the UK. Yeah. And you work, You said you worked for some companies, but what kind of companies were they? I mean, you, you started off studying accountancy and all of a sudden we'd gone into oh, the job of Spain. So what's the story? Okay, the there? story is I was studying accountancy and my father had suggested it. It really wasn't my choice. I fell in love with a girl. Me and the girl broke up. I was heartbroken. So I left England quit my job at the accountancy firm. I was doing a, I was doing a chartered accountancy training contract. So I was three and a half, four years in. Mm -hmm. And I was all heartbroken, wasn't interested in continuing what I was doing. And a friend of mine was running a record label in New York. And he said, why don't you come here? So I crept, grabbed my stuff and I left to New York. I left everything in the UK, left my career and everything. Did that for about a year. A record label. A record label in Manhattan. I didn't end up working at the record label. Well, I did, but it wasn't really going anywhere. It was a bit random. So in New York, I ended up working in a pizza place. I was a chef at an Italian restaurant. We were selling books by the university. And it was hustle, it was great fun. But my father passed away a year later and he lived in Gibraltar. Wow. And I'd overstayed my visa in the States because I had a British passport and he had a three month waiver visa thing. So I figured if I went to the funeral, I wouldn't be able to get back in. So we had to leave everything in New York. I was super happy that I would have stayed happily and both who came back to Spain was I, the family I was living with in Malaga City, which is where we are now, to go to the funeral, did the funeral thing, and then I was stuck here in Spain. And Spain is amazing, but work-wise, it's a bit challenging at the time, especially if you're young. So my plan was to go back to New York, but there was no work over here. So I'd been offered a job at a magazine as a sub-editor whilst I was in Europe, a magazine in the UK. Right. It's all very confusing. And since I was in Europe, I got back in touch with that magazine and said, if you're still looking for somebody, I'm available. So I flew over to England, started working at the magazine, worked for this very interesting lady called Bo Mags, which had a patch in her eye and ginger hair, lived in a sort of fancy village, just in a stately home. And from there, I ended up working in my clubs okay. as a barman. Again, always the plan was always to save money to get back to New York. That was always the the, the, the aim of the game here. And in nightclubs in the UK at the time, so we're talking, now we're talking 94, right? And in nightclubs in the UK, it's quite professional. 
in terms of the way the cut you work for a large company. There's a lot of big companies that run it. So it was Granada Entertainments that people had the TV station and all that kind of stuff. And I was doing super well there. I mean, it turned out that in nightclubs you, in the UK at the time, you could do incredibly well just by not being terrible. And I wasn't terrible. So, so I moved up the manager ropes pretty, pretty quickly. So I run my own club and then moved over to Rec Entertainment, several other European leisure, Luminar leisure, a few big companies. Eventually as an operations manager, running 13 bars, clubs, that sort of thing. And so that kind of made England a bit more enjoyable for me because of the variety. Daytimes it was, you know, uh, marketing meetings, accounts, reviews, all those kind of things. Evenings it was nightlife and, and driving around, checking out the life. So that kind of made England much more better work for me for many years. But I always wanted to come back. And I was waiting for an opportunity. This happens a lot to a lot of people that want to move here, whether they lived here before or not. You're waiting for this ideal situation to occur where somebody, oh, I thought, given that I'm an expert in cl running clubs and bars and stuff like that, it's only a matter of time before somebody says, hey, we used to live there, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't you come and run some of down there? Mm -hmm. And I'd be able to move. That didn't happen. So I just packed everything up, came over with my girlfriend and my two dogs, and I gave them, with enough money for three months uh, to hustle my way to finding a job somewhere, which I did. So that's how I ended up back here. And I got a job. I was prepared to do anything. I didn't care. I was well paid in the UK and nice car and all the usual jazz, but I was willing to exchange that for a better lifestyle here. And I'll do any job, I'm not precious about that. So I accepted a job at a, like a restaurant in Miramar shopping center or something like that. And that same day I thought, well, that's not gonna be of interest to me, but I'll do it for the money. I really wanted to go back into, into sort of the magazine sort of publishing side of it, I really enjoyed. And so that same day, I had a meeting with the editor of the Euro Weekly. I wanted to just offer my services for free as a contributor to help out just to learn the ropes. And by pure chance that day, she said, well, we happen to be looking for an editorial assistant. Would you be interested? Totally. So bye-bye to the other job that I got offered. And so you bye to McDonald's. It wasn't McDonald's. <laughs> it, was, it was like an Italian restaurant. It was in the kitchen or something. So I'd done that in New York. And so I got a job at the, at the paper, which is what I wanted to do. And again, it was one of those places where he had a lot of variety. It was a lot of a bit hectic, but super interesting. You get to learn a load about what's going on in Spain because they had editions in the Costa Blanca, Almeria, Mallorca, Costa del Sol, except Kia. So over, I did that for about three and a half years and it really was super interesting. I loved, I loved the job. Got to learn a ton about Spain as a growing up because I'd known it as a, as a young guy. And it made, it made me really find the business dynamics of the Costa Rica super interesting. So I left there in a editorial heat of the moment type of scenario. And I went to work at the marketing company. That's how I ended up doing that's it. That's Voodoo. Voodoo. And they specialized in real estate. They specialized in, in several things, but real estate was a big piece of that, just by the very nature of where the business comes from. So they they were developing a real estate specific website that worked with fiends and stuff like that. So this is now 2012. Mm. So I started there and, and the idea was I'd run the, they, they, they were a web development company that were getting a lot of marketing clients without really having a marketing department. So they kind of created a marketing department to service those clients, but they didn't really have anybody running it. So the MD there, Peter, he said, look, we'd like you to come and run it. We'll cut you in on the on the share of the company and all that kind of stuff. And my wife had been working there as a web developer for two or three years by this point, and she loved working there. And I was always a bit envious, so I jumped at the chance. And initially, the majority of the clients were real estate, but there's probably half that were also at the time. There's lots of companies doing like alternative investments and stuff like that. But eventually, we kind of specialized in real estate and the marketing side. So that's kind of got me into where a little like to now. And so the, so the reason you're now in marketing consultant for real estate is because of that, that journey. Yeah. yeah. And you yeah. got into and you started to understand how it works. Yes. From there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's actually quite the, the reason why I'm an uh, independent consultant now mm -hmm. is the part I was really good at, or at least I enjoyed. And I think if you, good, you enjoy something, you tend to be good at it. Mm -hmm. With maybe the exception of snowboarding, which I, I enjoyed, but it was terrible. But, but so the bit I was quite good at was the initial consultation with the customer, with the state agents. We would then agree a plan and I'd pass it to my team and they'd execute it. Yeah. 
So when I went solo, I thought, well, that's the bit I'm good at, so that's a bit I'll do. Hence the consulting thing. I think consulting is a bit of a, a bit of a bad, a dirty word, really, because everybody uses it for everything, mm -hmm. from developers to this to that. But so I often have to say, oh, it's actually what I do. Like if you want somebody to consult on a topic to do with your marketing, maybe slash sales, international real estate, Costa del Sol, talk to me. And if I don't know the answer, I'll be able to put you in the right direction. I'm sort of like, if you ever watched the Shawshank Redemption, mm -hmm. Morgan Freeman, he can get you stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of like that, you know? So yeah, like I, most of the time, I, I, it's not for me to help you, but I know someone that can. And that, mm. Yeah. Facilitator, so to speak. Yeah. And, and the thing is that the, what I really enjoyed and what it took me a while to learn was that not to give people what they were asking for. Now, it sounds really stupid, but agents would come in with like a list of things that they needed. I want three posts a week on Facebook, I want one, well, three a day on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, a blog, a this, a that. It's a kind of like, come with a menu, can you do that? And instinctively, you'd say, yeah, sure. And you'd do that. And then three months later, they would go, well, that's a, this hasn't done X, Y, and Z for us. And over, over a pro process of repetition of having that conversation, over a period of time, I'd go, right, why do you want these things? Mm -hmm. What do you expect is going to happen as a result of doing this? This only is a repetition. We haven't had the same conversation over and over. And, and once they told me what it is they were actually trying to achieve, most of the time, it wasn't what they were asking for. It was something slightly different. Mm -hmm. So it would be take the instruction, readjust it, tweak the strategy, and then execute it. That sounds, and, and that was really what, what worked, and that's what I do now. That sounds to me more of a sales role than, than marketing, so to speak, or sales and marketing. There's an element of sales in there because a good salesperson will listen to their clients and then advise them. Yeah, but it was never, it, it, I'm the world's worst salesman, mm. unless it's a topic I know about, in which case I probably sell it without realizing, right? What I mean there is that in, in, the, in the advice that I'm given, is trying to, it's matching their marketing activity with what they expect the sales tur turnout to be. So lead generation was another area, the big area that we dealt with. And certain things have a dotted line to sales, other things have a straight line to sales. And that is a large part of the advisory process. So, so rather than a sales person, it's more of advisory. Yeah. And so that's why I use the consulting. In retrospect, had I known how vanilla the term consulting is, I would probably got advisory or something a bit more fancy pants, which actually suggests well, that is what I do. So it, it's, it just saves mostly people in the real estate space, mortgage brokers, law firms, estate agents, developers, property portals. It saves time and money of going down the wrong avenue mm -hmm. for an outcome that you were never going to get. Yeah. I don't have the answers to everything, but I have done things wrong enough times to know that they don't work. Yeah. And that's really the key. So you were happy at Buda and so what made you make the jump to go independent? Same as everybody else, COVID. You speak to anybody that made a big change in the last five years, it was COVID based, right? So we were at the agency, we, we, uh, we had a team of four-ish in the marketing side, my team. As soon as COVID hit, everybody paused or wanted to pause their marketing. So we were then having to have the same conversation everybody had to have about maybe having these, uh, like, you know, uh, layoffs and stuff like that. And that coincided with my wife getting sick. Okay. And that wasn't gonna take a lot of all my attention. And so when I was speaking to the MD of the marketing agency about maybe the inevitable of having to maybe look at laying off some team temporarily, hopefully, I said, look, my head's not gonna be in this for the next few months. I'll go, let me take one customer so I know our market is covered mm. and let the team stay. It wasn't really to be better, to be nice, but it was in a sense, because I liked the team and I also to do the right thing by the company. But it was just, my priority immediately was my family mm. and it wasn't work. And I knew that. And especially we're gonna lay people off, I'd have to be more on the game with, with work and, and not less. And so I thought, well, if I could take one customer with me, it was a little bit like a Jerry Maguire, who's with me, but done with the permission of the company. And that one company was Cloud9 Spain. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's that association that I have with Cloud9 Spain. But I was, they were clients of Wood, who's the company I worked in for, I don't know, four or five years beforehand. Mm -hmm. Now, it was more of the marketing side that we dealt with, which was my department. So I'd be working with them anyway. 
And so, so Sean was my who's with me customer and he took a risk. He, they took a risk of leaving an agency that given them all support. They didn't know what part was me and what part was agency. And, but he took a risk that enabled me to, to leave. And that meant that my mortgage was covered. Mm -hmm. And then the customer, yeah, I had like a plan A, plan B, plan C, as you do. And touch wood, I'm pretty much still in plan A. So it's all kind of worked out the, the way I wanted to do it, what I wanted to do in the way I wanted to do it. And everything sort of seems to have worked out, touch wood. And your wife? My wife got well. Hey. Yeah, my wife got well. And yeah, it took, it took I'm, I'm a corporate guy. Like you wouldn't think that looking at the way I, with a cap and all this sort of jazz. But my background, when I say clubs and bars, people think of some sort of mafia movie. It was a corporate thing. It could have been Sainsbury's, right? right? It was a corporate job. So I spent 15 years or 14 years wearing ties and suits and driving up and down the motorways to meetings. And I'm, my style is a little bit more free, more a little bit more creative, a little bit more wacky. And But I'd always been corporate. And because I'd always been corporate, I didn't feel like I had that entrepreneur gene of taking a risk. Because to be an entrepreneur, you gotta have to take risks. It's not gonna, they're always gonna hand you a foolproof plan. So I didn't really have the balls, to be honest, to, to be caught, to do my own thing. I was always really looking for a perfect excuse to do it. And it just, they don't, it doesn't work that way. So, but the situation of COVID, the situation of my wife being set kind of forced my hand and gave me the courage I needed to make the decision. Yeah. And it was the best decision that I've ever made, but uh, I, I can't claim any, any sort of great planning as a result of it. It was circumstantial. And I think a, a lot of people that I speak to that made big, huge life changing decisions had a similar experience around the COVID time. Yeah. yeah. So in some cases, so for similar reasons, there were, it was the, the, the hand was forced a little bit by circumstances. Oh, since I've got to have to do this, I'm going to do that. You know, I'm going to leave, I'm going to start. I'm gonna... I mean, I, I deal with a lot of people who, are, uh, who run businesses or create creative businesses and are business people. Um, and a lot of the stories are is that they, they spend 15 years in, in, in a corporation or a corporate different going in and out of corporate jobs and it, it burns you out, right? <clears throat> then so what are you going to do? You've got to do something. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, Spain, let's face it, in the south of Spain, if you're coming in cold without any, any enchufe, as I call it, plugs, the jobs, you know, job connections, you're going to be a leisure or you're going to be a real estate. And this is the two things. You sell somebody a sangria or you sell them a house. So that's, that's the, so why real estate then is because it's the, the thing that's in on your doorstep. Is that, is that what it is? I didn't want to do leisure. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go back to leisure. It's not, uh, it's not a thing for families. It's not conducive. I've done it. I didn't be there about the t-shirt, but I find, I'm, I'm, I'm sad though. I find the international real estate market, the Costa is so fascinating. I, I don't gotta understand why, but because I find it fascinating, I'm good at it, right? If I didn't forget it, I'd be terrible. Like I am at other things, but I just, I find it fascinating. We're dealing with a second home market. There's so many moving parts. We've got agents here on the ground that are trying to figure out how to tap into those markets from all different kinds of backgrounds. There's all these different markets within markets here. It's changing. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I feel that I can bring value. And at least for normal people like me, if you feel you bring a value to the equation, you sleep well at night, and you feel good about yourself, mm -hmm. right? So I, I feel that, and it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good that I can have a conversation with an agent and in half an hour, save them some major headaches that they might have had without that conversation. And that kind of fuels you. You get feedback, you get, you get positive reinforcement. I'm like a little puppy. You tap me on the head. <laughs> I'm happy. I go, oh, I want to do more of that. And that's me, real estate. Okay. Well, listen, on that note, let's go and have some lunch, right? Let's do it. What's your yes. <laughs> now we have record. <laughs>